Uh, great. So let's get started. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Um, so it feels like it's been a long time since the last lecture. Hopefully, everyone um, so had enjoyable so fall break. Got to experience the the fall weather and the winter weather. Um, so um, um, so great. So um, so today we are so starting a um, so new. Um, so section of the class on so gradient descent. Um, and uh, so um, <laughs> this, this is a technique you may have seen before, but definitely at the, at the time I so started teaching this, this course, it was not commonly taught within the, so within the computer science curriculum. Um, it is probably one of the kind of a very, um, so fundamental algorithm that everyone should know, I think. Um, and it is really the backbone of most of machine learning and um, so data mining from like an algorithmic um, so perspective. Most of, the, most of the way the training parts of machine learning, which is most of the computation, which is a, probably a large fraction of all the computation that's going on now, uh, is some version of gradient descent. Um, um, so, okay, so, so there can be an entire course taught on this um, um, so subject. There is a kind of a five or 6,000 level course in the math department called, so optimization, which is a really interesting course that is, is all on kind of versions of things like gradient descent. We're gonna talk about, so three lectures on it. Okay, so this first lecture, I'm going to basically define the background, the, the, the kind of the, um, the notation and the kind of properties that you need to know. Next lecture, we'll talk about the actual, actual algorithms. And then the third lecture, we'll talk about how this is kind of applied onto, so, um, on to, to problems in machine learning and data mining. Um, so the kind of there there are lots of variants of um so gradient descent that go beyond just the basics of 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 so what it does we are not going to cover all of these um there there are kind of a lot of cool things we're we are going to cover the most important variant which is not actually probably traditionally covered in a generic course in optimization called so stochastic so gradient descent, and this specifically uh, makes sense for when you have some um, applications when you're when you're looking at data. Okay, this will be covered in the third lecture, and you'll kind of see what's going on. This is probably the single most kind of important <laughs> um, important optimization, and so we'll see why the the kind of the standard things people use um in optimization are versions of stochastic gradient descent but they'll have other bells and whistles on them as as well um so okay so let's kind of look at the schedule um all right so again we finish so linear regression but again the, we're starting gradient descent but the third lecture in gradient descent is actually going to be showing how to use gradient descent to solve the problem in um, to so solve the to to so to to solve the linear regression problem, you can use gradient descent to solve some of these other problems as well. We'll just kind of preview those once you get the idea for so for linear regression. It should make sense for the other problems. We'll so talk about later. In fact, we'll look at versions of things that can be thought of as gradient descent later on with, with dimensional reduction. The power method is kind of a gradient descent. It's an iterative algorithm. Similarly, the uh, Lloyd's algorithm for Keynes clustering we'll look at and mixture of Gaussians. These are kind of similar iterative algorithms and we'll explicitly talk about them within the, the classification section. Okay, the perceptron, again, will be an iterative algorithm, but we'll talk about more general optimization with gradient 
dissent in this in this context as well. So, so this really will be an important piece of kind of the computational um, side of, uh, of, of um, so looking at these techniques in data analysis. Um, so, okay. Um, other kind of important thing, if, um, if you haven't seen, uh, homework three is due next week, next week on, so Tuesday. Hopefully you've had a chance to start, um, start looking at it. Um, let's just kind of glance over this. We're looking with actual, actual data sets now, um, just to give yourself some, give you some experience looking at the linear regression problem. And I've tried to pull out kind of some important aspects of kind of um, doing cross-validation with this as well. Um, I'll just mention in the problem, C, you're asked to do some sort of cross-validation, but we're breaking the testing and train data. I told you to split it in a specific way. So this is all a deterministic problem. It makes it much easier to grade and to debug what's going on than if you randomly split. Um, that's why we've, we've done it this way. Um, the second question is kind of a longer word question, but um, does need implementation. The, the third one again will be implementation, but using, using gradient descent. Um, and I'll ask you to print out a whole bunch of stuff, okay? Print out every step you do something, you're gonna print out a line. This is typically how you do to kind of um, when, you're, um, when you're trying to understand these things and you're like debugging what's going on. And it will be easy enough for the TAs to kind of just glance through and grade and see if what's going on. So don't be alarmed, ask you to print all that out. It should be fairly straightforward after the lecture. We'll give you an example code with different functions and you'll solve for these functions. The first one should be easy, F1. F2 is a harder function. It's meant to kind of show you that it's not always easy. Um, and in fact, the last part of the question, you can extra five points if you do better on that function than a bunch of other people in the, in the course. So kind of give you a chance to give you something challenging. If you just do like reasonably well, you'll get full credit on it, right? But if you if you do do better, it gives you a chance to kind of explore some of the other techniques that we'll be we'll be talking about. Okay, um, that's due next week, Tuesday, and we'll go over the collab stuff on Thursday. Um, you can peek at it; it's pretty straightforward. Gradient descent is like two or three lines of code, so it's not too hard if you want to get started on that. Um, so, okay, let's talk about, all right, still connected. Okay, um, so, okay, so green to send. Um, the, the key thing we'll be talking about is some, um, some, um, so some functions, okay? And we'll be thinking about a function F and I'll try and use F here. Um, typically F is used as, as a function. Um, and we'll be talking mostly in the abstract today. And this will be a function that goes from RD to R. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that the, um, the, um, the domain of the function the input is a d-dimensional vector, right? So we're going to be thinking about what, should I get all the consistent variables here? Yeah, so let's talk about, so the, that means this function is going to take in a value and we're gonna use alpha here, alpha one, alpha two, up to alpha d, in, in RD as the input, right? So when I call the function, I'm gonna pass in not just one function, one value, but a d-dimensional vector, right? So think of this is RD here, this is, is R, right? So the function is going to be defined for any point in the space. There's gonna be some, you know, so, 
some function. And what's going to happen is this point is going to, there's going to be a, a single um, value for every point in RD, it's going to map to a, exactly one point on, on this function, right? So this is how we think about this. Um, so function here, this is F. Okay, for every point in the um, in the domain, there's one point in the, in the range of this function. Okay. And so I'm going to use alpha here um, because these are going to be the way this is used in gradient descent is these are going to be alpha is going to be exactly the parameters that we're going to want to optimize for our kind of our data analysis like this model in um, we're looking at in so linear regression. Okay, so remember we had the parameters. Once we've determined those parameters that define the, the model and linear regression, these alpha are going to be those same parameters here. So I'm going to use the same this um, so same notation. So when we move to the setting where we're actually using this to kind of learn the model, it will it will make sense. You'll have the same sort of notation here. Um, so, okay. Um, all right. So the next thing I want to do is kind of define some properties of these functions, which is going to be necessary to kind of understand what grain descent is, is going to do. And probably traditionally, in a lot of places, you would see these defined through calculus. I think we will get to calculus in this lecture. We will have to define stuff with calculus will be important. I think this initially does not provide as much intuition. So I'm gonna give you a geometric view of these key of these key definitions. And if you've seen them before to find through calculus, hopefully this will complement that view. Okay, so the first thing we need to define is going to be a, um, a so a, local neighborhood okay and we're going to define this through a a ball you can define local neighborhoods in other ways the simplest way to do this is a ball um we'll call this br uppercase br of alpha and th this is going to be all the points in rd so this is a set such that the distance between alpha and P is going to be less than or equal to R, okay? So I've written these curly brackets, right? These curly brackets here means it's a set, right? The curly brackets are indicating it's a, it's a set. The P and RD means all the objects in the set are some points in D-dimensional space, right? So this is a subset of RD and these points are defined with the property. This bar tells me they must, these points must have this property. And that property is that their distance to alpha, which is, um, which is here, the distance to alpha for many of the points P is less than R, right? So it's less than, yeah, so this R here says the distance must be less than R, right? So let's draw this as a picture. You have um, you have alpha is a point in RD, and again, a ball. You have some radius, and for any point P, which is less than a distance R, that's, that's within a Euclidean ball, that's inside of this ball here, right? So this is B, R, at alpha, so the alpha is the center and R is this, this radius. Okay, and we wanna consider a local neighborhood of a point alpha, and we want to allow R to be anything. R is a value which is greater than zero. But we can say for a local neighborhood, this can be any value R greater than zero. So I can let this go very, very small, as long as it's not nothing, right? It has to be something but this is kind of a neighborhood of alpha and I'll define it in this, in this way, okay? So we'll think of, remember alpha is down here and a local neighborhood of alpha might then be some region which is in this domain. This is a subset of RD, 
right? It's not up here on the function, it's down here in RV. And this ball, right? Th 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 this is a ball of radius alpha around, um, of radius R around alpha. This is some, some neighborhood. Okay, and I want to know how the function behaves in this neighborhood. And we want to use this to define things like what's the minimum and the maximum and local minimum and maximum of this function and properties. And these are going to be kind of the things we're going to search for in this, in this function. Okay. So, okay. So, so these are, so once we have this, we can now define some important concepts. It's going to be kind of a bunch of definitions today. I think some of them are kind of fun, but they are a bunch of just definitions. Um, we'll get to some really cool algorithms in the next two lectures. So this will pay off. Um, okay, a local maximum, okay, of, of the function f, okay, is, is a point alpha in, in Rd. Um, so, so, um, so, so such that for the um, for the local neighborhood, and we'll use B R alpha for some local neighborhood, um, all points in this local neighborhood have F of P is going to be let's see uh, less than or equal to F of alpha, okay? So you can think of this now. I like to draw a picture of alpha, right? And there's, this is some, some local neighborhood of alpha. The radius doesn't matter, it's just sufficiently small. And then for every point P, the function value is smaller, right? So I could think of this, um, you know, so often you'll you'll start with examples where in 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 two D where the the function this is the the function f and then this point alpha corresponds with the function value here and the local neighborhood is here and all of the function values in this local neighborhood are smaller than the function value at, at alpha. Right, so if, if I drew this across, this is F alpha, and everything that was in its local neighborhood is going to be smaller here, okay? I like to think of this, I like to picture this as a, as a ball where I'm not seeing the function, I'm just kind of imagining the function where it's coming out at alpha, and it's, it's further out of the plane than it is everywhere else, because this is actually, a more useful way of thinking about when you get to higher dimensions, and we will be in higher, higher, you know, fairly high dimensions here. The one dimensional one will sometimes hide some of what's going on here. Okay, so the, this is a, it's a local maximum. We say that the local maximum is, um, is strict if f of p is, gr is always less than f of alpha. So there's no equal here. Um, there's no less than equal in this case. Strict means it's there's there's nothing the same. Um, otherwise, you could have a function value here, um, right? Where this is my function. It's a constant, right? So, so for a point alpha, well, everything in this in this uh, in this neighborhood of alpha, they have the same function value. So it's everything nearby here is less than or equal. They're all equal. This is kind of uninteresting. So sometimes we'll talk about these strict um, strict local maxima. Um, as we deal with 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 linear regression, we will see cases where we have strict local maximum. But if we're not careful, we will get ones which are not strict. And then we have this weird situation where we want to find, say, the maximum or the minimum of a function, and we have many different options. We want to kind of avoid this. And this actually actually comes up, and we'll see why and how to, how to avoid these things. Um, okay. Um, we can also say 
will be more potentially more interesting is the local minimum. Okay, and th that will be everything the same except f of p is going to be greater or equal to f of alpha. Okay, so it's pretty much the same picture here, um, right? Uh, where kind of in this local neighborhood, now all the function values of p are going to be greater than alpha. Right, so I can just if I took the negative of a function that, where alpha was the local maximum, then it's then alpha is going to be the local minimum. Um, so it's just kind of a, right. So think of a function like this. And so if I have alpha here, then there's some local neighborhood where all the function values are greater than alpha in this in this local minimum here. So this is a, th this guy is a local min, okay? Okay, and so I can make, so, you know, I, I could have it so these functions are very, um, so wiggly, right? But I can still have a bunch of these, of these local, min, I can have more than one of these local min, right? As long as there's some arbitrary small neighborhood where things around it are always increasing, then these are all of these, <laughs> these, these local minima. Yeah. Okay. I can make the neighborhood as small as I want. So this is satisfied and that, that counts. All right. Um, okay. Okay, so these local min are nice and sometimes getting to a local minimum will be all we're able to do, but generally what we would like is a um, global, um, so maximum, um, so minimum, okay? And so the, this is um, a, so, um, so this is a, um, a um, again, a point alpha in, in RD um, such that um, for all P in, in RD, F of P is going to be with the, the maximum, it's gonna be less than or equal to F of alpha. Okay, and again, if we want the, the minimum, we do f of p greater or equal to alpha. And if we want this to be so um, is so strict, if f of p is, is less than f of alpha or f of p is greater f of alpha, right? So without the equal, right? So we'll often want this strict case. So there, it gets rid of this case where you have this constant function, right? We don't necessarily, um, the, if we have the, or it's, it could be constant for part of it even at the bottom. And, and again, this will occur if we're not careful when we're dealing with linear regression, it turns out it's gonna, it's gonna correspond with the same sort of cases where we wanted to solve this, this uh, we solve it and there's a matrix inverse and we can't take a matrix inverse. It'll be the same case where we don't get a strict local minimum in this case here. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so these global maximum means that, so if we could have a, a function here, the, the local neighborhood looks the same. Um, we have RD, we have R, we have a function. Okay, so this function goes off to infinity. I put arrows means it's gonna keep rising, right? So if this is a fourth degree polynomial, it's gonna have potentially two of these, uh, of these, uh, of these local minimum, um, and will go off to infinity in uh, all directions. Um, this one, this alpha is the um, global min. And this one, I'll call this guy um, alpha prime. This is a is a local min, right? So the neighborhood around alpha prime 
is, 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 is a minimum, but it's not the global minimum. There's someplace else that is, is, is better. Okay, and so these functions are going to be something that we design and we want the global minimum of these of these functions. Sometimes we'll get stuck in a in a, a local minimum and we won't know if we're in a global or a local minimum and this sometimes is a problem. Um, in the in the stuff we're going to talk about we're generally going to have only we're not going to have this problem of getting stuck in a local minimum where we accidentally find this solution and we think it might be this solution, we're going to model the problem so that does not occur in this course. However, if you go beyond this to more complicated techniques, like if you're dealing with like deep neural nets, they use gradient descent and they will not be able to guarantee you find a global minimum of your of the function that you want to, you might get stuck in a, in, in a local minimum. Um, they kind of started about 10 years ago. Everyone started using these deep neural nets and they're doing this. And sometimes they got stuck in these, these, these local minimum and their solution. And then there are a bunch of research papers and people said, I think that's okay that we get stuck in local minimum. Um, you know, I think these are more rationalizations than a good justification, although sometimes it's fine. Um, they, they still tend to work, okay? Um, but in, in other cases, there, there are very serious issues where you do get stuck in local minimum. We will see this when we talk about the clustering problems. We will run something like a great descent algorithm, and that will be subject to some bad local minimum where we're not getting the, the global minimum, and that will be an issue, okay? So it's important to distinguish these, these concepts, okay? Um, yeah, so actually the, the regression and the classification parts, we will guarantee there will only be a global minimum, but not in say in, in clustering. Um, and this will magically work in the algorithm we talk about for dimensional reduction, but for different reasons than we'll cover in the gradient descent section. Okay. Um, okay. Um, hopefully this is all kind of you've you've seen most of this stuff before but it's important that that we that we covered in case it's not fresh in your mind um okay so the the kind of the next thing that i've kind of um skipped over is we'll need um so so continuous functions okay so i don't know the 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 definition for a continuous function is, is not as important as you kind of just conceptually understanding kind of what's going on and, and that you realize, okay, this stuff will work for continuous functions, but won't work for non-continuous functions. Okay, think of a function like if this function, where there's some discontinuity. So, okay, if you remember how this works, I have a d-dimensional vector down here. Every value maps to a single value in the function, right? Um, and so, in fact, let me maybe fill this in so it's well defined. Okay, so now, um, so for a point alpha, again, this maps to a single value, um, and I both. Well, what I need is that in the neighborhood of some alpha, I can make this neighborhood arbitrarily small and that I guarantee that there's also an arbitrarily small neighborhood that all the function values lie in, right? So if alpha is mapping up to, to here, that I want to say that there's some neighborhood in the, in the range space that it also maps to it. Now I can make, as the neighborhood around alpha goes small, the neighborhood in the range also goes, goes small. And that is not the case here. This one is dis, has a discontinuity. This has a um, discontinuity, okay? Where there's a jump in the value of the function, okay? And you can get in situations where this occurs. Um, you could actually have functions defined you could you could think of um, 
uh, function defined with a kind of um, um, where it's it's got a it's it's like this step values, right? You can think of so, some of you know defined functions in, in this way. This one is also um, is, is not so continuous. This whole machinery we'll talk about will work for these continuous functions. So it'll be nice and important to define functions which are which are going to be continuous. Um, you know, the, the, this will seem pretty obvious for a while until we get to the classification section. And when we're in classification, actually the most natural modeling of the problem that we will want to solve will give us a function that we will try and stick into this F function that we're going to try and optimize, which is not going to be continuous. And so we're gonna to need to do something. We're gonna to have to approximate that discontinuous function with a function which is, is continuous in that case, okay? So these are dis, discontinuous functions. In case it's not clear, this is an example of a, of a continuous function. All right, so, you know, I kind of defined some stuff in words that was formal, but hopefully this, this all makes sense. If not, okay. Okay, good. All right, um, one more thing, it's kind of a um, couple more terms that's important to define. Um, Okay, so I'm a, so one of the reasons I'm kind of going through and defining this is that if we get like functions that are a very general concept, but if we get them so that they're nice, there's this um, that follows certain properties which seem quite intuitive, hopefully, then this grain descent algorithm is just gonna kind of it'll work for these huge classes of functions, right? So I, I kind of need to define all the problem cases and then we can say, okay, Assume we don't have these kind of these problem cases and then everything will work. Um, so it's a bit kind of um, definitions, but uh, all right. So a saddle point is another one of these kind of problematic cases, which we're gonna hope is not going to occur. And um, all right, and, and so this is another point in RD. And I wanted to find this again with a, local neighborhood such that for um, the um, local neighborhood um, B alpha, okay? So this saddle point is gonna be one that is not kind of a nice point to deal with, but it's not a local minimum or a, um, or it's now local max either. It's one of these special points. I'm gonna have, um, so I, I'm gonna have some um, P in um, this local neighborhood with um, function value P um, greater than F alpha, so it's greater, yeah, and, and some P prime, in the local neighborhood with F of P prime less than F alpha. And these are, these are, and these, um, and these regions are not um, um, so connected. Right, there are going to be two type of points p, um, p which are both have function value greater than alpha, but I can't get to them without going through a point p prime. Okay, um, not connected is kind of a technical definition. I'm not going to totally write out, but now this geometric picture is going to be very helpful here. Okay, so I'm going to have alpha in the middle here. This is my local neighborhood. Okay, and I'm going to kind of divide this region into some way, okay, where I'm gonna have points P, I'll call this A, um, this is 
P1 and P2, and I'm going to have that um, the function value for P1 is greater f of alpha, and function value of P2 is greater than f of alpha. Okay, so I'm going to sh shade these in. These are regions which are any points in here in this region is going to be greater than f of alpha. And I'm also going to have um, p prime one and p prime um, two, where f of p prime one is going to be less than f of alpha, and f of p prime two is also going to be less than f of alpha, right? And that's going to be, in fact, these whole regions here, right? And and this is going to be true no matter how small I make this, this local neighborhood. As I keep shrinking down, I get kind of the same picture, even as I get really close to healthy. Um, so I can make the local neighborhood as small as I want. And I can't get from um, P1 to P2 without going through this green region. Okay, so this is a, is a saddle point. I'm going to try and draw. A picture here, and the reason it's a saddle where in you know Utah, part of the old west, there there are horses, and there are these. I don't know, how, you know, if you've ridden a horse, there's a saddle you 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 put on the horse, and it kind of wraps down around both of the legs, but it kind of comes up, kind of to keep you in place a little bit here, right? So th this is kind of me. So it kind of comes up in these directions here, right? So um, these are, this is the point alpha. As I go down in these directions, these are, let's see, this is P1, this is P2, and this is kind of P1 prime, P2 prime. And you can kind of think of Kind of this is on the saddle, your legs are going down either side, but this is kind of holding you in place front and back, right? Um, so kind of you kind of think of this three-dimensional function kind of going on here. And that's similar, well, it's kind of a twisted version of this. These are going down in the green regions and the blue regions are kind of coming up here. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it could be a bell curve. It could, it could be any sort of kind of way the curve is going, but it's kind of continuously going down, right? So if I drew a line maybe directly between P1 prime and P2 prime, and I just looked at that line, right? If I just looked at some line here through here, well, P1 prime and P2 prime are both less than F alpha. So now alpha looks like a local, looks kind of like a maximum here from this perspective, going up and then it goes back down again. But if I look in the other direction, right, now I look at from P1 to P2, well, alpha looks like kind of like a minimum. I'm going down until I get to alpha, then I'm going back up again, up, up to P2, right? Um, so it depends on the direction I look at, whether it looks like a local min or, or a local max. And this is kind of a special point. It's similar to a local minimum or a local maximum in that effectively, these are points where the gradient, which we'll define next, is not going to be, um, is going to be um, zero at these points. Like the local min, local max, and the saddle points, it's gonna be zero. Um, these can be more complicated. I've drawn this where, the lower regions, there are two lower regions and there are two upper regions, but there can be more than that. That's often, some places that's called like a monkey saddle. <laughs> I'm not sure where that comes from. Um, I guess if a monkey is riding a horse or if you're riding a monkey, you have to, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how that, where that comes from, but anyways, it can be more complicated. And in higher dimensions, I think this picture is much more helpful to think about than, than these sort of pictures. Um, in 1D, in 1D, some people may write this as a, as a saddle point here, um, where you have a function and it kind of, it, at a momentarily has a gradient zero, but this direction is always down, this direction is always up. That definition is not so, so helpful. I mean, that's not really the challenge here. 
That's sometimes also called a saddle point, but we're not gonna use that definition. That one is not gonna be helpful in thinking about higher dimensions. These sort of pictures are what's, what's going on here, right? If you, and kind of what can happen is, um, you know, I, I'm gonna try and get to the lower part of the function and the green parts are lower. So if I somehow walk down to the alpha point, then I could go this direction or this direction, either the P1 prime or P2 prime, and which decision I make might, I might end up in a different local minimum and having to make decisions is, is often kind of, um, is what makes, you know, it, what would make solving this hard. I don't wanna have to make decisions like this when I don't know which one is, is going to be better. Okay, great. So these saddle points will mostly avoid these, although again, in, in, if you have multiple local minimum, you're likely to have something like this. And in the clustering problems, we will have some, th there'll be some saddle points when we look in that case. Um, yeah, so, okay, but well, we won't, yeah, well, we'll just kind of, that's kind of, that's the place where the algorithms are kind of less um, amazing and how well they work. And we're just kind of try and ignore these problems. <laughs> But in, in other in the rest of the of the class we will we will figure out ways to avoid this in the modeling we will create functions f where this does not occur right and then we don't have to deal with them right we get to design our algorithms we get to design our models let's design them so this doesn't occur okay um, okay then okay um, basically now a I can talk about, so regular points, this is a point in, in RD that is not a um, local min, max, or um, so saddle point. Okay, so um, basically a regular point is going to be everything else, okay? Um, so again, I can, one way to think about this is if I have a, uh, alpha and a local neighborhood around alpha, that there's going to be some line, some, some way of dividing this into exactly two parts. And one part is going to be all above and one part's going to be all, or all, I guess this is P and and this is p prime p prime is all below p is all above um so i'm going to have f of p prime is going to be less than f of alpha is is less than f of p okay and so i'm going to have this kind of nice situation okay if, if i'm in this situation i'm at alpha right and I wanna say, I'd like to get to the minimum of the function. Well, I know I should go in the direction of P prime somehow, right? This, this kind of makes sense. Um, and so that's gonna be good. Almost all points are going to be regular points and all, and, and except for some strange situations we won't deal with that you can learn about in a, in a, in a class in the math department. Um, most points are going to be regular points, right? There are, except for crazy functions, there are going to be a finite number of these, of these minimum, maximum, or, or saddle points, and an infinite number of these, of the regular points. So if, 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 I'm, if I'm at a point alpha that I want to evaluate the function, it's almost always going to look like this, like this, this regular point, okay? And if we're walking down, the only, place we would get stuck in might be a minimum and that would be a good situation. Okay, so, so we're gonna almost always be able to think with these regular points and this is gonna kind of be good. Um, you'll note there is this interesting line here, right? I've drawn this dark blue line through this, this local neighborhood. What are those points on that line? Yep. Uh, yeah, right. So all of these points, all these points are, you know, it's kind of interesting to 
think about. There's this point Q. That in any local neighborhood, there are a whole bunch of points that have equal function value to F. You know, that, that, that might kind of seem, seem strange, um, but, you know, it's also hopefully that becomes kind of intuitive that's the case. You haven't thought of it before, but um, F of Q in this case is going to be equal to F of alpha, right? So we're going to have a bunch of these points which are the same function value. Um, and that's always, you know, basically always going to be the case for the, for the or for continuous functions the local neighborhood will always contain some points which are equal unless it's a local minimum or it's a local maximum um, and a strict local minimum or strict local maximum. So you're gonna have some of these points, but again, these points are much smaller in quantity in, in measure than, than the points which are above or below. So we typically don't worry about them so much. Um, although well, I'll draw some pictures that draw these ISO levels, which are all the points with the same function value at some point. Okay, great. Sounds good. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about are convex self so functions. Okay, convex functions are going to be some very nice functions. They're gonna have, um, if they're continuous, then and they're and they're and it's and it's convex is pretty much going to have all the properties that we want. So let's figure out how to define these convex functions. Um, before I do that, I'm going to define a line. Okay. Um, well, we've talked about lines before. Hopefully, this is kind of you understand what a line is. But we're going to think about this in a slightly different way. Um, a line. I'll call this L. P, Q, and I'm gonna define this with two points. Okay, we're gonna have P and Q are gonna be in R, D. So I can think of drawing P here and Q here. And I want the line that goes through these two points, P and Q, All right? So I want to define this, this line that goes through these two points, right? If I always pick two points in D dimensional space where D is at least, um, yeah, even if it's one, I can always draw a line that goes through these two points, even in as long as I'm in at least one dimensional space. I don't know what zero dimensional space would be, um, at least Euclidean space, but I can always draw a line through these two points. Okay, how do I, def and I want to define this line as a kind of, um, as a, a linear combination of these, right? So I'm going to def define this specifically as the, set of X in RD, right? So all the points on this line, this could be some, um, some point X here, right? Um, such that um, I can define this X as, uh, actually, um, yeah, let's do X equals Lambda times P, plus one minus lambda times Q, right? And this will hold for all lambda in, 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 in the real numbers, okay? Yes, these two lines are a little bit weird here. Let me put a comma instead. Okay, um, all right, so P and, so what is this doing? I have P and Q are going to be um, points in RD, right? And lambda is going to be a scalar of just a single value. So one minus lambda is also a scalar. So we know how to do this. Where in linear algebra, we have vectors. We can multiply them by scalars. We can add them. The result is also a point in R D. Okay, so this makes sense. Um, what is actually going on here? Um, lambda and one minus lambda are kind of balanced, right? Um, Right, this is kind of some bouncing. I'm saying it's some linear combination of P and Q, and any linear combination has to be some um, kind of I'm I'm a coefficient times P or Q, but I'm just gonna use one parameter. And this is actually convenient because a line is a one-dimensional object. If I set lambda equal to um, let's set lambda equal to zero. Where where on the line am I going to be? 
Q, yeah. So that lambda equals zero, the part I multiply by P is zero, the part I multiply by Q is one. So this equals lambda zero. What if I set lambda equal to one? If I set lambda equal to one, the one minus lambda part is going to be zero, right? And the part in P is gonna be one. So I'm gonna get exactly back P. Okay, for lambda equal one, I get P back. What if I do lambda equals to one half? Get right in the middle here, right? This is lambda equal to one half. Okay, so how do I get X then? How do I get X on the line, roughly? Uh, yeah, right, so this is roughly equals to lambda negative, um, negative one half, right? As I lambda gets smaller, I'm giving more and more weight towards Q and less weight towards P. I'm actually subtracting some elements of P. And I'm, um, right, okay, and as lambda gets bigger, I get past P in the other direction, larger than one. Okay, so, and, and so, so another kind of, uh, kind of, Interesting thing here, lambda p q bar, which is gonna be the line segment between p and q. This is lambda, this is, sorry, L p q bar. This is L p q, this is the whole line. But if I just want the line segment, then this is just gonna be the set um, lambda p plus one minus lambda Q such that lambda is gonna be in the range zero to one. Okay, so if I just want the line segments, then I'm just gonna take the points in between P and Q on the line there. And I can do that by just restricting lambda be, to be between zero and one. And that makes sense with this picture too, right? Okay, this is known as a convex, um, so combination. Okay, whereas the line is defined as a, um, this is a, it's a line, so um, linear combination. Okay, I get all values, right? And, and then this notion of a line, linear combination, this kind of, kind of uh, we've heard linear combination before, the linear algebra part, and it gives you a line, this is, kind of where the word linear is coming from in this, in, this, uh, in this definition of linear algebra. Okay, but convex combination, well, we're gonna want a convex function. Um, this convex combination is gonna be a bit more useful in understanding. Okay. Um, okay, hopefully this, this all makes sense so far. Um, so we're gonna find this line segment between P and Q as the convex combination. Um, okay, and now let me define a, I'm gonna use this to define a convex function here. Okay, a convex function. Okay, um, so this is gonna be F. This is gonna go from RD to R. So this is gonna be such that for all points P, Q in, in RD, okay, I'm gonna write up the definition and then we'll kind of look at, um, and, um, and then we'll look at some pictures of this. For all lambda in zero one, okay? This seems like the components I need to make a, a, this line segment, this convex combination here. We're gonna have this property at F of lambda of P plus one minus lambda of Q is going to be less than or equal to lambda of F of P plus one minus lambda of F of Q. Okay, so on the left-hand side, I've done this kind of convex combination trick inside the function. And on the right hand side, I've done it outside the function. Okay, so what is going on here? Um, 
Let's draw our picture. So this is going to be our D, but we're going to have two points. I've just drawn it, you know, in one dimension here, right? But uh, think of this as RD dimensional space, and this is is R dimensional space. We're going to have some function. We'll say this is our function f. Now I want to draw these function values f of p. This is going to be the value f of p, and this will be the value f of q, okay? And I can actually think of them as points here. This is, yeah, let me think of them as, think of them as p, f of p, right? So this is a point in d plus one dimensions, and this is q, f of q. Right, so now these are in our D plus one, right? Um, so now I have this D plus one dimensional points that where this is the X coordinate where X might be D dimensional and this is the Y coordinate of, of the points here, okay? And so, okay, so now let's look at the left hand side here. This left hand side, I can think of a, um, yeah. Actually, let's think of, let's, let's look at the right-hand side first. Um, the the right-hand side, I have the linear convex combination going on inside here. So that corresponds with the points here. And I'm then I'm going to map them by the function. And I'm going to get all these function values corresponding with these points, right? So I'm gonna get the blue function value, right? This is the, I'm only calling the function once for all the points in this interval or this line segment between P and Q and RP. And we're gonna get the blue function value back, right in here. Okay, so now let's look at the right-hand side. Now I'm kind of doing this, but outside the function, and so now I want to think about these points here, and I'm kind of taking the, for every value in on the line between P and Q, for every value lambda, I'm kind of directly using these function values. I'm going here. I'm taking the direct line in this D plus one dimensional space. Okay. And so if I look at, for instance, some value um, lambda equals to one half, um, Use I'll keep orange here. Um, this would be lambda equals to one half. I find that um, that the the blue or orange function is lower, is less than or equal to the green function. Right. So if I draw the line between the points, that always stays above the function, and this is for any two points P and Q here. And this is the definition. When this holds for any P and Q and any lambda between zero and one, then F is a convex function. Okay. And what it looks like is something like a parabola, right? A parabola that has a positive coefficient on the on the first on the first term, right? Kind of like, but it doesn't need to be a parabola. This is kind of a generalization, the, a good way to think about it is a generalization of the properties that like this, this um, up-facing parabola has. That has a single, so what's gonna happen is gonna have a single minimum. The single local minimum is the global minimum. And it's gonna kind of be nicely behaved in some way, right? This is a convex function. Okay, cool. So I, I said we're just doing definitions, but these are some kind of cool definitions. Yeah. What would happen if like F was this Yeah, you could sometimes you sometimes you call that a a concave function. Sometimes uh, I would probably 
Concave functions can have different meanings. I would probably call it the negative of a convex function. <laughs> um because concave has been overloaded with some other other terminology that might mean that or it might mean something else but i'd call it the negative of a convex function yeah um it's still nice that would be good for finding the local maximum but typically like and, and like a, as we saw like if you remember way back with this thing where we're trying to we assume gaussian noise and one dimension we want to find the mean we find the maximum likelihood estimate, but we actually put a, you know, remove this, a negative sign, and then we want to find the minimum of some function. And you would typically formulate it that way. Typically, you want to formulate it with convex functions where you want to find the minimum. And that's why it's less than or equal instead of greater than equal. Um, that was just a, a, a choice someone made a long time ago, and, uh, and that's how we do it. And it's could have been the other way, but um, you know, it's a, I guess a sliding doors moment. Um, that probably didn't didn't matter. Um, okay, um, great. If this is oh one more thing to add here, um, if this is instead going to be less than or equal, then I say this is strictly convex, okay? Um, again, if you don't have this case, if you don't have the strictly convex case, then you can have a function that looks, yeah, if I don't do this, I could have a function that looks like this, um, Right, like it's just a, a, a line, a linear function. This is also convex. It's a convex function. Um, you know, it's, it's a straight line because if I take the linear combination, I draw the line segment, well, it's exactly the same as the function. So it's, it's convex, but it's not a very useful function. And in higher, you know, in one dimension, this seems like, okay, it's not a big deal. I know how to deal with lines, but in higher dimensions, you might have it. So some parts of it, some views of it, some subspaces look like the blue one, which is nice here, and other ones look like the red one, and then you kind of, or maybe they're even flat, and then you're kind of, you need to deal with this in a weird way. So I, you know, we're often want strictly convex functions, um, which is like that. Okay. Um, okay. Great. So um, convex functions have a lot of nice, um, um, so properties, okay, so um, let's say F and G are both RD to R and convex, then I can say that H is equal to F plus G, this is also convex, H is equal to the max of F and G um, this is also convex. All right, so think of um, think of a convex function, call this F, and this is G. So then this would be, you know, th this would be uh, F plus G is this black kind of line in here. This one is also convex. Um, the adding them will actually be more important. It's a little, little harder to draw. I'll try and draw this later, of course, yeah. Oh, yeah, that I drew, I wrote a Q right there. Yeah, <laughs> let me highlight it instead of erase it. Very good, um, G, thank you. And, and up here as well, yeah. Right, so I've got, um, if I take the max or the sum of them, th this, this sum will be important. If I divide it by a constant, um, H is equal to, or C, um, F, or C is a, um, C is in 
R D and C is greater than zero, then the, then F H is also convex, so I can scale them. If I take a negative a negative number, this doesn't work. Um, the, but but so probably the most important property is going to be that um, that F this convex function convex has a single, um, well, so say if, if alpha in, in RD is a local min, then alpha is a, um, is a global minimum. Okay, so if F is convex, if alpha is a local minimum, then it's also a then it's also a global minimum right here, right? So if alpha is a local minimum, it's also a global minimum. So if I find a local minimum and will run algorithms that do this, I know it will be a global minimum. That's not true if it's if it's not a convex function. I don't necessarily know that. Okay. Um, and then if it is strict, if it is um, strict, then um, exactly one um, global min. Okay, so if, if, if it's a strictly convex function, right, then there's exactly one global minimum and exactly one local min. Okay, and again, that's the picture we typically see here. If I go back to this weird case over on the side here, that can, if it's a constant function that's completely flat everywhere, right? It's, it's just, a, it's always returns a single value. Everything is a global min, that's not very interesting. But if it's a strict, strictly convex function, then if I find the local minimum, I know that is the only local minimum and it is a global minimum. And, and so, Good. So we're going to want these strictly convex functions if we can get. Them. Okay. I am um, having to find gradients here. I'm going really slow here. I'm having too much fun up here. Okay. Let's 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 get into in a, in a gradients. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, we're kind of past the geometry. Part of definitions to talk about gradients, we kind of need to talk about so calculus. Um, so, so again, we're going to have f of alpha, um, where alpha again, alpha one, alpha two, up to alpha d, and we're going to have a unit vector u, call this u one, u two, up to u. D and remember the unit vector has the norm, the two norm is equal to one here. Great, okay. Um, so we're gonna interested in, um, in differentiable functions. Um, Okay, and differential will just mean the next equation is defined. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the gradient and this is called a, um, a nabla symbol in, in lots of, kind of an upside down triangle. Um, and we're gonna nabla u of f of alpha is going to be the limit for some value h as it goes to zero of f of alpha plus h u minus f of alpha divided by h. Okay, so this should look like the definition of the derivative um, you've seen in calculus course, except I need to have this unit vector u here. So this is a so a directional derivative. This is a directional derivative 
a tiv. Okay, and I need this because um, because my data is going to be in d-dimensional space. If I just had a one or two-dimensional function, I wouldn't need this. I could define derivatives with respect to those individual coordinates, but I'm going to be in a high-dimensional space. So I'm going to talk about this directional derivative, and it's pretty simple. I'm moving alpha in some direction u by an amount h, and that amount goes to zero, right? So I have alpha, a point in Rd, and there's some unit vector u, and I'm getting to kind of some point alpha prime, and I want to know what happens to the function value, how much it changes as h goes to zero, meaning I shrink how far I shift. And I could pick any direction here. This is defined for some direction u. We're going to pick specific directions next. Okay, and a function f is differentiable if this is always defined for all, all u and, and alpha. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's pick some specific of these values u. We're going to have these functions e1, e2, up to ed, which are going to be these vectors in rd. And ei is going to be all zeros except for a single one. And this is going to be the ith coordinate. So the ith coordinate for ei is going to be one. So E1 is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. E2 is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? And these are, so unit vectors, right? These are a bunch of unit vectors, and they point along the, the coordinate axes, right? So if, if I'm in two-dimensional space, then this points along the x-axis, and E1 points along the x-axis, E2 points along the y-axis, right? So I can think of these generally as the d-dimensional um, basis vectors. And now I can define a partial derivative from this directional derivative. And I'm going to write it as um, nabla ei of f alpha is going to be d, um, d, d, d alpha i of f alpha. And I'm just going to use as a shorthand, this is just going to be um, nabla i of f of alpha. Okay, so this will be a partial derivative. When I, when I do this, this is equal. When I take this directional derivative, it's equal to the partial derivative of just the i coordinate. That means that, remember from calculus, partial derivatives, I fix, I assume all the other coordinates other than the ith one are constants, and only the ith one is a variable, and I take the derivative with respect to that. Okay? Um, so partial derivatives are, aren't that much harder than kind of uh, um, regular derivatives. They just require more kind of um, some extra notation here. And this is the same thing as if I use these unit vectors in, in, in this case, because I'm then I'm only moving in the i coordinate in this by amount h. So these, these are equivalent concepts here. Okay. Um, and now I can define the derivative or the, sorry, the, the gradient. This is now. gradient, write it as nabla f. Okay, this is without a subscript. There's no subscript on the nabla now. And this is going to be equal to d of f d alpha 1 e1 one plus d of f d alpha 2 e2. Two. Right, so the, the output here is going to be a vector. Each e1 is a vector, e2 is a vector, times some, some coefficient in front. That's what the partial derivative gives me a coefficient, which is d of f, d of alpha d, 
E D here. And because these E ones are mostly zeros, I can just directly write this as a vector D of F, D of alpha one, comma, D of F, D of alpha two, comma, of D of F, D of alpha, alpha D. Okay, so I just take all the partial derivatives, okay, out along each of the different coordinates. Each of them is just their derivative where I just set everything else constant, right? And I do that for each of them and I put them in a vector and that is the gradient. This is the gradient, okay? That's the calculus definition of the gradient. Okay, so I assume all of you have taken calculus before. Um, and so maybe you haven't seen or you're rusty on partial derivatives, but this, this, so it's notation and stuff here, but it should all be from first principles of stuff you've seen before. Okay, so um, uh, let me go through, gosh, I'm, yeah, good. So let me just go through an example and then we will, and then we'll think a little bit about how to kind of, kind of in, intuit about this beginning of next lecture. And, That'll be fun. Okay, so let's say alpha is equal to x, y, z, right? So it's it's a it's it's a a value in R three, and we have a function f of x, y, z. This is our f of alpha. This is three x squared minus two y cubed minus two x e to the power z. Okay. Okay, so this is a function that you should be able to take the gradient of. Let's go ahead and do this. All right, so I need first um, the, the, the gradient of this. Well, I first need to take the partial derivative with respect to x, right? So y is fixed, z, y is a constant, z is a constant. So the first term, becomes six X. The second term is a constant, so that disappears. And the third term has an X in it, so that's minus two E to the Z, right? The second term, well now Y is, it's the great derivative with respect to Y. This is negative, um, um, what's what I get? Six Y squared, right? And then the third term, it's got the Z is the, um, is, is the variable, okay? And so this should be, the first two terms are constants now, right? So the third term, if you remember how this works, X is a constant, so that goes into the coefficient here. So I can get negative two X, that's the constant in front, and E to the Z is its own derivative. Okay, so this is the gradient. Okay, and if I can evaluate the gradient, let's say I evaluate it at a, at a point, right? If I evaluate it at three, negative two, one, what is this gonna return? It's gonna return a vector, right? The, the gradient, remember the gradient F goes from RD to RD. So I'm gonna return a vector here and I can just plug these values in. So I'm at a point, three minus two, one, and I want to evaluate the gradient. I just plug these in and I should get, um, let's see, 18, that's three times six minus two E, okay. Um, I plug the Y in and I get, for a minus two, I get minus 24, because the negative and the two is in the square, so that cancels. And then the last term I need to plug in an X and a Z value, right? And I should get negative six E. Okay, so I can evaluate a gradient as well and I get a vector. Okay, so some definitions, that's a gradient. We will think about, I'll start the next lecture by reviewing gradient and how to think about these. And then we'll use this 
in our algorithms in gradient descent. And we'll talk about when and how they work. And we'll go through some code, some examples. Okay, great. So uh, I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>